Hearing being held this 22nd day of February 2024 in W064 of the Indiana Government Center South 402 West Washington Street, Indianapolis, Indiana at 9.26 a.m. Local time is being conducted pursuant to the laws of the state of Indiana as signed in Indiana Code Board Act 21 5 before the members of the Medical Licensing Board of Indiana and a cause docketed as administrative clause number 2023 ML0003. It is hearing to determine whether the Disciplinary sanctions should be imposed on the respondent's license based on the allegations raised in the complaint filed February 8, 2023. The notice of time and place of this final hearing was emailed and mailed on February 8, 2024. Notice is also given to the Office of Attorney General of the State of Indiana and to Respondent's Counsel. My name is Dr. Strollo. I'm serving as hearing officer for the board. Following the members of order, I'm looking on this hearing Dr. Dunaway, Dr. McCann, Dr. Lucina, Dr. Mastin, Dr. Bryant. At this time, I would request any board member who feels that he or she cannot give this petitioner a fair hearing and render an impartial decision to remove himself or herself from this hearing. Hearing that appearance of counsel. DAG Ian Matthew for the state. Holly Reedy from Reminger for Dr. Adiabbo. Okay, and do we have witnesses that will need to be sworn in? We do. Okay. Uh, any witnesses who will be testifying, please stand and raise your right hand, and Mark, you will swear you in. Sure. 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 I, I don't think his testimony will be necessary. You can go ahead and stand. Okay. The, uh, do you both solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to give in the matter before you will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help you, God. Yes, yes I do. Thank you. Cheers. Is that a cold face? Members of the state is here today seeking discipline of the medical license of Dr. Adeogbo. Um, evidence today will establish that in May of 2020, uh, the respondent rear-ended another vehicle on Highway 41 uh, while he was under the influence. Uh, there was the sole occupant of the vehicle, the driver of that car. Um, at the scene, he failed a field sobriety test and then tested on a preliminary breath test, ultimately tested above 0.08 on a chem test. Um, he was arrested and charged on three counts. Um, in December of 22, um, the respondent ended up pleading guilty to the second of those counts that was operating while intoxicated, endangering a person. It was a class A misdemeanor. And he was sentenced to one year, uh, all of which was suspended to informal probation with some community service requirements. We filed our complaint shortly thereafter in February of 23, and the case has been pending since then. So the evidence will establish the sole count here, which is conviction of a crime harmful to the public. Um, and at closing, I'll ask you to find him in violation as alleged and then sanction this license. Uh, there are some mitigating factors here, but this is a pretty clear licensing violation. And so we're bringing the case here to decide what's the appropriate sanction for his license. Thank you. And it may save a little bit of time with the hearing and evidence today. Dr. Adiago is not disagreeing with the allegations. He pled guilty to the charges against him, as, as the state has just informed the board. And so the hearing today is really a matter of oral argument on what is the appropriate sanction, if any. Um, we had a pre-hearing conference. <coughs> and after that conference, we decided that this was a good opportunity for us to go ahead and proceed with the final hearing to discuss sanctions. Um, Dr. Adiagbo has pled guilty to operating a vehicle while intoxicated and endangering a person. He was sentenced by the state of Indiana for that charge and for his plea, and he has fully fulfilled all of the requirements of the state for his acts. Dr. Adiagbo is a board certified forensic pathologist who practices in Terre Haute. He's licensed in both Indiana and, and Kansas. Prior to this incident, he had no previous criminal history, no previous medical malpractice history. The state does not dispute that Dr. Adiabo does not have an addiction problem and that this one incident had nothing to do with his medical practice. They will not present any evidence on those two points and they've confirmed with me that they're not challenging those two points. The facts that led to why we're here today are simply that Dr. Adiabo made a very poor decision on one occasion. He was only a, a mild social drinker prior to this incident 
and he had a couple of drinks at dinner and didn't appreciate the strength of those drinks and made a bad decision to get in a vehicle. This does not, uh, what? again, no addiction issues, not related to his medical practice. Dr. Adiago had to appear for a multidisciplinary assessment in the state of Kansas due to these charges. And he went to Kansas and had several days of, of testing and meetings. And that board found, or that group found that he is fit for duty as a physician, that he, there's no evidence to, to demonstrate that he's suffering from an alcohol use dis disorder or an addictive process, and that his arrest stemmed from his poor decision to overindulge in alcoholic beverages on one occasion. He's also submitted himself to ongoing counseling. I've spoken with his counselor, his therapist, confirmed the same statements of the, of the Kansas board, that he is fit for duty, his therapist has no concerns for his medical practice. I didn't bring those individuals in today because again, the state is not arguing those points. Um, the state is stating that he should be sanctioned because a first time offense, DUI, that had no connection to his medical practice. And as we sort of determined and discussed in the pre-panel hearing, that is not consistent with the precedent set by this board in other cases that typically a first time DUI with no addiction issues and unrelated to the medical practice doesn't even result in an administrative complaint being filed. It wasn't exactly clear why one was filed here when normally that wouldn't be the process, but Dr. Adiago has done everything required of him to you know, face the consequences of his actions on that one occasion. There are severe consequences for Dr. Adiago of a reprimand. The board admittedly offered him a very minor reprimand to close this complaint, but agreeing to a, a reprimand and a fine would have an impact on his practice. He is a forensic pathologist, so he practices and testifies as an expert witness in both criminal and civil cases. And if he's required to have a National Practitioner's Data Bank report, on his medical license in Indiana, that will be used to attempt to discredit him in every trial that he testifies to moving forward, both criminal and civil. Further, Dr. Adiagbo has been a victim of ongoing, this, this is sort of a side issue, but it relates to why no sanctions would be appropriate here. Dr. Adiagbo, before practicing in the United States, practiced in Canada. And he testified in a criminal trial in Canada. And as, as many of, as you can imagine, there's always someone unhappy with the pathologist's testimony. And in that case, he gave an opinion on cause of death and the family was not happy with his opinion. And I, I've represented him for many years because he has been subjected to repeated and ongoing harassment from this family. They are trying to discredit him as a physician they have filed multiple AG complaints against him in the state of Indiana and Kansas, all of them being closed in his favor, claiming that he is a fraud, claiming that he lied about his medical background and training. All of those uh, allegations have been found in his favor, but this individual continues to harass him regularly, including within the past six months, uh, trying to interfere with his business contracts and, and trying to continue defaming him. The person's located in Canada, so we have limited opportunities to stop the harassing behavior. But if this board issues a public reprimand against Dr. Adiago, it's only going to exacerbate those problems with this gentleman. I'm, I'm certain, having been his counsel the last few years, that such a reprimand would, would result in a new flurry of, of claims, uh, news media. Unfortunately, they've, they've had our news articles published about these false allegations against him. And so for that reason as well. But most importantly, it sets a dangerous precedent for all physicians in Indiana. Sanctioning him today will set the precedent that a first time DUI, unconnected to the practice of medicine and without an addiction issue, should result in a public reprimand and fine that will follow that physician with a National Practitioner's Data Bank report for the rest of his or her career. And based on my discussions with other practitioners and attorneys, I don't believe that that is the precedent that has been set to date, and I don't think that it should be applied to Dr. Adiago. <clears throat> 
Indiana Code 25-1-9-9 provides allowable sanctions for a physician. The language used in that statute is permissive. It uses the word may. The board may impose any of the following sanctions. It does not say shall. The board has discretion in some cases to determine that yes, a violation occurred, but we believe that a sanction is not a necessary and appropriate measure. And so we ask the board that this case of any uh, is an appropriate sanction would be to just dismiss the case against him. In particular, because it really shouldn't have been filed to begin with. Uh, most other first time DUIs do not result in an administrative complaint. I have one more point to address. I think the state will argue that what's different about Dr. Adiagbo's case is that the woman he hit, her family did later file a wrongful death claim against him. Yeah. Uh, the state has not proven wrongful death in this case. And I was able to access the medical records of that patient from the civil case that has been filed against him. And it's simply not a wrongful death case. Uh, the accident happened in May of 2020. At the scene, States Exhibit C, the police report will, sh will show you that this woman was standing and walking and talking at the scene and refused medical care. Did they strongly encourage her to go to the hospital because of the impact? She, a year and a half later, and she did have some injuries from the accident, but a year and a half later, she presented to Union Hospital in Terre Haute complaining of shortness of breath and, and cough that had been going on for a month. She was admitted to Union Hospital in September of 2021, a year and a half after this accident. Um, and during that hospital admission, they found an advanced stage mass in her lungs, and she subsequently passed away during that same hospitalization. Her discharge summary has a list of, of 16 different diagnoses. Um, this woman had every comorbidity you could imagine none of which were related to being in a car accident a, a year and a half prior. Um, I have the discharge summary, but my preference is to not make it a part of the record because the patient, I have redacted her name, but you know it would not be hard to connect the dots and find out who the patient is identified. But I have copies of the board would like to look at it. And I'm happy to read the discharge diagnoses or the, the hospital course summary that's included. Okay. We'll get into that. So, all right. On state court, would you go ahead and your... state? We'll call it Andrew Mills. Miss Mills, can you um, state and spell your name for the record here? Sure, it's Andrea A N D R E A. Last name is Mills M I L L S. Right. And where are you employed, Miss Mills? I am employed at the office of the Indiana Attorney General in the licensing enforcement section. All right. And what is um, what are your regular duties as an investigator? Uh, I'm an investigator, so um, my regular duties would be to uh, collect evidence, review databases, um, take statements from any witnesses or other persons involved, um, essentially to determine whether or not a licensed individual has um, violated any of the laws that govern their professional license. Okay, are you familiar with this case in particular? I am. Uh, can you tell us how? Um, I reviewed the file and was asked to testify in this matter. Okay. And so can you tell us how did this case come to your office's attention? Sure. Um, we received a consumer complaint against a respondent. All right. I'm going to show you here states exhibit A. You identified this for us. This is a copy of the consumer complaint we received. All right. And then who filed it? Um, this was filed by an individual from the uh, medical licensing board. All right. And who is it filed against? This is filed against our respondent. Okay. And when was it filed? Um, this was filed on, looks like the date on this is June 4th, 2020. All right. Is this a true and accurate copy of the consumer complaint your office received? It appears to be. Right. We'll move to admit exhibit A. The objection. Dare say objection, shall we? Oh, excuse me, sorry. <laughs> Hard to break habits. That's right. Okay. So is there an objection to the hearsay contained in the document? Okay. I'll allow it. Okay. So please admit states exhibit A. 
Okay, Ms. Mills, can you tell us where the allegations here in the complaint? Sure, the allegations in this complaint uh, were simply that the respondent self-reported to the board in an email um, the uh, vehicle accident okay. that had allegedly took place on May 27th, 2020. Okay. Um, the respondent also indicated in that email um, that uh, he was charged with driving over um, a BAC of 0 0.8. He indicated 0 0.8 um, and then indicated that it caused serious bodily injury. All right, and so did the respondent submit any kind of response to this complaint? Uh, he did. All right, I'm going to show you here State's Exhibit B. Can I identify this one for us? This is a copy of the respondent's response. Okay, and can you tell us when it was submitted? This was submitted, uh, it appears to be dated July 2nd, 2020. All right, looks like there's a couple different pieces here. Can you just tell us oh, what we're right. looking at? Yes. So um, the first page dated July 2nd, 2020 appears to be the actual narrative of the response. And then attached to that, um, it appears uh, that there is the initial email that was sent to, I'm sorry, the initial email sent from respondent to the medical board, as well as an email or a letter um, sent directly to the medical board uh, from, it appears to be a colleague of okay. respondents. All right, so is this a true and accurate copy of the response you received? Yes, it is. All right, we'll move to admit exhibit B as well. Objection is to hearsay. Okay, uh, I'll allow it. So please admit states exhibit B. Okay, so what, uh, what did the respondent say in his response here? You um, just uh, just overview here for us yeah. here, so he can tell us. Essentially, uh, respondent didn't deny the allegations. Um, yeah. He essentially indicated that he had two alcoholic beverages on the night in question, um, and did not feel intoxicated when he left wherever it was he was consuming these beverages. Um, he then stated that he traveled a short distance home where he um, was involved in the accident in question. Um, he, according to this response, um, he was, he submitted to a breathalyzer and blew a 0 0.09. So not necessarily the 0.8 indicated in his response, but a 0 0.09 was um, the alleged level. And I would object to this witness uh, misstating the testimony in their exhibit A, stating that he blew a 0 0.08. His, his message actually said, I was charged with driving over 0 0.08, causing serious, serious bodily injury. So there's, there's no statement in the exhibit that he said he was only 0.08 or that he did cause serious bodily injury. It's fine. So the case was pending at the time and it was pending when he submitted his response. It was. Was your office able to get more details about this criminal case? Yes, we did. All right. Did your office get any sort of records of the prosecution? We did. All right. I'm going to show you here State's Exhibit C. Can you identify these for us? Yes. These are the um, okay. criminal records that were received from Vigo County okay. um, for a respondent. All right. And so are these certified copies yes they are all right i'll move to admit uh so it's exhibit c objection is to hearsay within the within the police records okay i'll allow it to admit state to give a c all right so there are several documents here miss mills can you kind of tell us tell us what we're looking at sure there are a couple of different cases here 
Um, the first case that was filed um, was filed with two charges. Um, the first count was operating a vehicle while intoxicated, endangering a person. Uh, the second charge or the second count was operating a vehicle with alcohol concentration equivalent to at least 0. Point, I'm sorry, 0. 0.08, but less than 0. 0.15. Um, this case was ultimately dismissed um, due to the, some changes in the charging information. There was an additional charge ultimately added um, which was causing a serious bodily injury when operating a motor vehicle with an ACE of 0 0.08 or more, which was a level five felony, which would explain the need to have two cases. The first case was a uh, criminal misdemeanor case. Okay, so we'll, we'll focus on the case that ultimately proceeded. Um, can you tell us again what those, uh, what the charges were? Sure, so the charges in the, I apologize, let me find my correct page here. So the charges in, the later case, there were three counts. The first count was causing serious bodily injury when operating a motor vehicle with an ACE of 0 0.08. The second charge was operating a vehicle while intoxicated, endangering a person. And the third charge says operating a vehicle with alcohol concentration equivalent to at least 0 0.8, but less than 0.15. Uh, and can you give us an overview from these records of the incident that led to the charges? Yes, I can. Let me just take a moment. Please. Find the correct page. Almost. Yeah, you know. Me to just summarize? Yes. Okay. If you would. So essentially, um, the officer who was dispatched to the scene made contact with the respondent. Um, but, but. It appears there were two vehicles involved in the accident where a respondent had allegedly rear rendered the other individual. There was heavy front end damage to his vehicle, and it was located off into a grassy median. <clears throat> the other vehicle had heavy rear end damage. When the officer made contact with respondent, um, respondent provided his information. <clears throat> And the officer noted that respondent's manual dexterity was poor, his eyes were watery and bloodshot, and that there was a strong odor of alcohol emitting from his breath. <clears throat> Ultimately, um, respondent participated in some standardized sobriety field tests. Um, Respondent ultimately 
was breathalyzed. Right. Yeah. Yep. And blew an equivalent to 0. 0.112 grams of alcohol per 210 liters of breath. And he later was taken for a chemical test. <coughs> and that chemical test resulted in a reading of an alcohol concentration equivalent to 0. 0.091 grams of alcohol per 210 liters of breath. And he was ultimately arrested. And so, and so what happened with this case? Did it, did it go to trial? Did he plead guilty? Was it dismissed? Respondent um, ultimately pled guilty to one of the counts uh -huh. of the three. And so which one did he plead guilty to? Um, Respondent pled guilty to count two, which, um, to remind you all, was operating a vehicle while intoxicated, endangering a person, which was a class A misdemeanor. All right, and what was his sentence? Um, it was uh, one year uh, jail time, which was suspended, um, and he was issued probation in both. Okay. Okay. Um, I don't have any other questions. Oh. Just have a couple questions. Ms. Mills, I just yes. want to clarify, Dr. Adiago self-reported his, his actions, is he that did. correct? He okay. did. And I just want to make sure that there wasn't an inference that when he made that self-report, he was exaggerating or being inaccurate. I when think it was a typo. I think he, it, it appears to be he may have mistyped his. Well, if we turn to yes. Exhibit A mm -hmm. and Exhibit A to the complaint, it is an email from Dr. Adiago to Adana Moran, May 29th. So within two days of this incident, he self-reports. And and I, I guess I'm not certain what the what the typo would be because his specific words were, I had a vehicular collision and I was charged with driving over 0 0.8, it should have been 0 0.08, yes. causing serious bodily injury. Correct. But it wasn't your understanding that he, it, that he admitted. I think when you testified, you said that he caused bodily injury. You, it, it was, he was telling you, he was attempting to report what the charge against him was, correct? He indicated that he had a vehicular collision. He did say that. Yes. And they had a, yes. And the rest of that is what his charges were, correct? It's, it does say I had a vehicle, excuse me, I had a vehicular collision and I was charged with driving over 0 0.8 causing serious bodily injury. And to your knowledge, at any time, did Dr. Adiago fail to take responsibility or deny his actions? To your knowledge? Not to my knowledge. Okay. Have you seen any document to indicate that? I haven't. Has someone else? Not to my knowledge. Okay. And were you aware that he also completed 120 hours of community service as a part of his sentencing? Yes. And he had a retroactive driver's license suspension? Yes. And unsupervised probation? Yes. Were you aware that he made this plea in December of 2022? And by May of 2023, he had completed all terms, including the 120 hours of community service? Yes. In investigating this matter, have you seen any evidence of Dr. Adiago having an addiction problem? I have not. Have you seen any evidence that the incident related in any manner to his medical practice? I have not. Have you seen any evidence that Dr. Adiago is not fit to practice medicine? I have not. I don't have any further questions. Any redirect? Uh, no redirect. Okay. Have questions for the witness from the board? That's right. <clears throat> Counsel, I'm trying to understand your logic. I believe I said, 
for the case analyst. No, quickly. <laughs> okay. Well, you'll, you'll be, but I'm happy to take questions. You'll, 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 you'll give your chance. Okay. So, uh, your excuse. Me. Thank you. <coughs> Say we call the respondent. Captain. Okay, doctor. Um, so you heard everything Ms. Mills said here. Um, so tell us what happened on May 27th, 2020. Um, May 27th, 2020. Could we take a break for just a moment? Could we ask that the media be moved behind us? My client's trying to answer questions on a serious matter and he has a microphone shoved in his face. It's just, it's distracting and it wouldn't be allowed in any courtroom setting. I'm not suggesting they can't be here, but in the idea of personal space and him being able to, to focus on the board instead of a microphone being extended to him. I, I think that's there. Can, can, can you move over there maybe? I've always sat right here for every hearing I've ever been at. Well, I think you've never been asked to move. <laughs> I know, I've never had an issue. You, you, you're, 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 you're allowed to be here, but I think it, I I think it is fair to the respondent. Okay, yeah. yeah. Where do you want me to move? Uh, can, can you do what you need to do from over there? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <coughs> Could he actually be behind us? Again, we're just moving corner to corner. I, I want my client to be able to focus on the board, not the news media. And so he, 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 at that at that look, he didn't have a microphone in his face. And again, okay. I, I, I've had microphones in my face, and I and I get it. Uh, I, I, I think that allows him to do what he needs to do, and he can just look straight ahead. Thank, thank you for your previous yeah. decision. <laughs> Could you repeat the question? Sure. So, doctor, tell us what happened on uh, this uh, at this incident on May 27, 2020. Uh, thank you. And thank you for the accommodation. Uh, on May 27, 2020, it was the background of that day was supposed to be a very joyful day. Uh, so on that particular day, we a few days before that, and on that particular day, it just uh, myself and some colleagues were able to support uh, an individual. I'm sorry, we're what? No. We're able to support an individual who was. Um, uh, Seeking a position for uh, Corona, and uh, um, it was successful in, in because we actually helped that person to uh, get some funding, some funding to proceed with the uh, candidacy, and uh, on that evening. Uh, there was a kind of reunion and kind of celebration of the achievement uh, of that day. And um, we went to uh, a restaurant uh, and I uh, took two drinks. And afterwards, I started going on. In fact, my home from the restaurant at that time was about six minutes. So it was very short drive. And uh, uh, unfortunately, as I was uh, going on, I uh, found a car right in front of me and Suddenly, and I uh, crashed into that car. Yeah. 
later found, I found out that the car just, that was a gas station just to the right. And the car just pulled out of the gas station. Just Not to the, uh, to the right lane, but to the left lane. So the car pulled over right and left. Yeah. Anyway, even that was the case, I totally accepted my responsibility for the uh, for the event of that day. Uh, I collided with the car. The area ended the car on that day. All right, and then so the uh, police show up here on the scene. Um, and they gave you some tests, is that right? That is correct. All right. And they gave you a breathalyzer test, is that right? That is correct. All right. And uh, do you remember what you blew on the test? Uh, I think. Yes, sir. Uh, oh, just like uh, you stated earlier, uh, I do uh, like the right. Yes, I, I blow uh, zero point one one two grams okay. of alcohol two hundred and ten liters of beer. Okay. And then you were given a second test later, is that right? That is correct. Okay. And what was your what was your uh, result on that test? That was zero point zero nine. Okay. And so then you were arrested. That's correct. Okay. And you ultimately pled guilty. That is correct. Okay. And let's see here. You were placed on uh, informal probation, is that right? Correct. And uh, what did you have to do for your probation? Yeah. Uh, during my probation, I attended the. All right. So this the uh, seminar of uh, cars on driving uh, a mother that gives drive uh, drunk driving which I completed and I got certification for that I attended uh, 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 counseling uh, I I um, did that ongoing basis, okay. and um, I <coughs> attended. Uh, I did my comedy service during this period in a uh, boys and girls club, where I mentored and participated in all the activities of the young ones. Okay, and. Um, Okay. And uh, then were you, are you still on probation? Were you discharged from probation? Actually, uh, I've completed, uh, I've completed it and I've been okay. from probation. Okay. And uh, any subsequent arrests? No. Okay. Um, any issues? Um, at work with uh, drinking, anything like that? No. Okay. Um, I don't have any other questions. I just have a few questions, Dr. Aniapo. Are you a board certified forensic pathologist? Yes, I am. And are you licensed in both Indiana and Kansas? Yes, I am. Did you self report the incident that occurred on May 27th, 2020? Yes, I did. I did you have any prior criminal history to this incident? No. 
Had you ever been sued for medical malpractice prior to this incident? No. Do you feel how, how do you feel remorse for what happened? Tell me about that. Terribly. Terribly. Every day. Every day. Dr. Adiago, you've been you've heard me talk about it. You've you've heard me ask questions about this. Do you believe that you have an addiction problem or an issue with alcohol? I don't. Prior to this incident, did you have an issue with alcohol? No, not at all. In your opinion, was this incident related in any manner to your Indiana medical license? No. And did you submit to a multidisciplinary assessment in Kansas? Yes, the most intrusive examination of the lab. The most intrusive examination. It was several days of multiple providers, is that correct? Correct. And have you reviewed the results of that multidisciplinary assessment? Yes, I did. And is it your understanding that they found that you were fit for duty as a physician? Yes. Is it your understanding they found no current evidence to demonstrate that you're suffering from alcohol use disorder or an addictive process? Yes. And that your arrest stemmed from poor decision making to overindulge in alcoholic beverages on one occasion. Yes. And, and this is a bit personal, but did did the group interviewing you also find that you had actually suffered post-traumatic stress disorder from the harassment of the individual that I was discussing earlier in Canada? Yes. And is it true that that individual has filed? multiple medical licensing complaints or attorney general complaints against you in both Indiana and Kansas? Yes. At least three in the state of Indiana in the last four years, is that correct? That's correct. And you were subjected to an investigation for every one of those cases? <coughs> That's correct. And every case resolved in your favor? Correct. Well, Did all of the cases in Kansas related to this individual also resolve in your favor? Correct. Is it your understanding that this individual had a, a news media outlet in Kansas publish an article about their allegations against you? That is correct. And has this individual continued harassing you as recent as the last couple of months by trying to interfere with your medical business contracts? That's correct. And if you receive any sort of sanction today by this board that is reported to the National Practitioners Data Bank, do you have concerns that it will give that individual additional reason to continue harassing you. Yes, I'm afraid of that. Okay. What's that? Are you also an expert witness in criminal and civil cases as a forensic pathologist? Yes, I am. Do you ever testify on behalf of the state in those cases? Yes, several times. Are you concerned that a report to the National Practitioner's Data Bank related to this matter will harm your credibility and your ability to <clears throat> testify as a forensic <clears throat> pathologist. Yes, it will. Is it your understanding that you've been sued in a civil case related to this car accident? Is that correct? That's correct. And is it your understanding that the individual who you rear-ended in this car accident died a year and a half later from completely unrelated matters to this incident? That is correct. And are you asking the board today to acknowledge your action? but find no sanctions are appropriate under this circumstance and to exercise their discretion in not sanctioning you further. Just a bit for that. Do you feel that you have paid your debt to society by your criminal plea, fulfilling the obligations of that, the civil case, and going through all of these processes? Yes. I don't have any further questions. Questions from the board? Right. Yeah. Thank you. Dr. Bryce, do you <clears throat> still drink alcohol, maybe even socially? No. Explain to me, you pleaded guilty. It's also it's part of the record. Yep. If the board decides to take any sanction, and I can't predict what the board will do, 
how will it hurt you? Because there is already a record that you have pleaded guilty. There are two different type of records. There are the the uh, the LDPP record is is permanent. Is uh, affects your licensing, affects your practice, affects your uh, ability to certify as which is fundamental to my profession as a forensic pathology. The uh, like so the court uh, decision and the uh, judgment that is this that is it is not related to my practice. It does not it is not related to my being a physician that is related to an action that <coughs> I'm committed and I own up to it. And you know the entirety of the action and the consequences and the repatriation and, the, and the, my, my acceptance and the service, those are concise and self explanatory. However, the professional aspect of it <laughs> indicates and put a stamp, a permanent stamp, to my ability to practice yeah. and even to earn a living. And every utterance, every testimony yeah. become questionable as a profession. The doctor, you realize if you drink alcohol beyond the limit, it will impair your judgment. So how can you say that it will not affect your practice of medicine if you had to drink beyond the limit? That is a good question, sir. On this day, it was in the evening, I was not on call, and I was in this celebratory world, and it was a wrong judgment, a wrong decision by the room. I got carried away. I've learned my lesson. I think yeah. it was a successful day until that moment. And I got carried away because everything we've done that day has been successful. This will never repeat itself again. Thank you. So, <coughs> any other questions? Do you, uh, Go. Go. Do, you, do you know what the initial injuries were that the person knew? Um, I, to be honest, the Is medical that records that I was provided were very long and I was looking for the cause of death. I don't have the records related to the hospitalization at the time of the accident. Did you say she declined to be transferred? Did she eventually go to? Yeah, she went to the hospital and she did have some injuries. I, I don't know the extent of those injuries. She did have some injuries. Uh, that was that Yeah, that was my other question. Was good. What, what actually did Kansas wind up doing? I mean, you said you went through this process. Yeah. So, so did they have any? any sanctions or? I'm not his counsel in, in Kansas, but I'm not aware of any. Kansas closed out everything. Is that correct? Yes, Kansas closed out everything. Um, I'm in good standing in Kansas. No letter of reprimand? No reprimand. No sanction no, at all? No, nothing. After the uh, uh, receipt of the, of the uh, uh, psychosocial and uh, uh, fit to practice uh, uh, evaluation, uh, they reviewed the case and uh, came to the conclusion that 
I think the practice and uh, there is no further uh, further uh, action to be taken. And that with Kansas State is gross. And he's also had to defend in Kansas on this person who's trying to discredit his credentials. And all of that has went in his favor as well. Doctor, you went through an assessment. Where was that at? That was at acute acumen. Do you have documentation from that? I have a copy of it, but again, it includes a lot of pers very personal things. And if we could put a confidential cut, my concern is again with this individual who has been coming after him. I expect a, a FOIA request following this for, for documentation presented, and I really don't want his personal medical information to be become public record and end up on the news or wherever else. I have copies for the board. I don't know if you would want to review them, then not make it a part of the record, or if we can make it a confidential exhibit. Well, so this become public. Uh, if you put contains PHI, then we say we need to make it a confidential exhibit. Okay, and it does. Or, or, or can you, so I have the same question, can you submit at least, I, I believe the Brother Council stipulated that he does not have alcohol use disorder. Was that a stipulation or not? Sure. I mean, it is or it isn't. Well, I'm not presenting the report saying that he does have one, so. And he and has the charges. The, the charges report. are not about that, so. But I think Ms. McCann wants to know, do you have alcohol use disorder or not? And can you submit at least a portion of that Kansas evaluation? I'm, I'm happy. To, I actually have one copy of it, I just realized. I'm happy to give this entire thing. I also have some highlighted sections that I can read to you. What, why don't you submit that? We'll keep it confidential. And if you could submit a uh, redacted uh, for public access version of it. OK. Uh, within the next week or so. OK. Uh, we can handle it that way. Yeah, yeah. thanks. So that's about when you submit this one. I just don't want the board to think that we're hiding something when there's large redacted portions. I just I don't want his personal private information to become public. Well, well, may I ask a quick question real quick? You said that that was, that was submitted as a part of the Kansas proceeding? He, yes, Kansas actually required this assessment. It was a multidisciplinary assessment for fitness of duty evaluation. And it was completed by, he was examined May the 2nd to the 5th of 2022, several days. The examination consisted of one, two, three, five. I think, I think Mr. Hardy's question is, yeah. is it public record in Kansas? And if so, why are you worried about it in, in Indiana? It is, to my knowledge, it's not, because he didn't have a public hearing in Kansas. Well, and I would imagine the hearings. state would protect these sorts of reports in, in Kansas as well. Tori, is that? I have additional questions. Yeah. Um, Doctor, as part of your criminal hearing, you were required to complete complete treatment at Urban Associates. Could you yes. explain the treatment you received there and how long that lasted? Yes, uh, it, it was a psychological counseling, and I, which I, I focused on the uh, the initial treatment period was focusing on the. Uh, accidents and my use of alcohol. At this point, uh, that has stopped. I mean, we've completed that process. However, I'm still engaged with uh, my company because of the post-traumatic stress from the abuse and the uh, harassment from uh, from this man. Uh, the, Canada. So I am still engaged with Mark Huban. It's Dr. Michael Urban, Dr. a psychologist Michael, in psychologist in Toronto. How long did the portion of your treatment last that was related to the accident and the alcohol? Yeah, it, it lasted for over, uh, uh, I would say, almost a year. Okay. And could you give me an estimate of when that was. Uh, if this helps you, these are your dates of your Kansas assessment. Yeah, sure. So uh, this, um, the Kansas assessment 
is it it that was entire week of mm -hmm. of uh, uh questioning interrogation and assessment including uh intelligent coaching including psychometric user a lot of stuff that were coming man with mark cuban is more about dealing with but why? all these aspects of life that um I've been, I've, been, I've been exposed to and the stress of Germany and to make right judgment and to cope and to... So it, it, it was an ongoing and that... Um, Did you start that after this? Did you yeah, start I after started that? after this. And for the board's yeah, knowledge, yeah, again, yeah. without getting into too much of his personal history, Dr. Adiago has suffered very tremendous trauma and tragedy within his family unit unrelated to any of these things so i'm imagining some of the ongoing treatment with dr urban is is related to his family loss okay uh, i'm sorry yeah. the treatment with dr is it dr urban was after acumen it, yes it was after after yes. okay yeah. my other question is the civil case that was filed related to this incident. Is that ongoing? That's correct. Okay. I spoke with his attorney yesterday because I'm not defending him on that and they're still in discovery. I think it's kind of moved very slowly and you no, know, neither side is really pushing hard on it right now. So nothing has happened recently. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions for the witness? Would that look? Okay. State reps. We don't have any additional witnesses. And do you want me to provide no. the confidential copy now or? Yeah, we'd like to at least, I think it will help our discussions if we have a copy. So maybe somebody can maybe copy he and his stuff. You just get to write. Boards, really quickly confidential on it. Goodbye. <laughs> So we get a chance for us to state something. Can we provide this? Uh, not that I plan to do it if you. Well, I mean, are you going to give a closing statement? Yes. Okay, I'll wait for that. Mm -hmm. If I can be answering my question. Are you just going to see right now? Thank you. Thank you. You can answer. Okay, so while they're making those copies first, why don't we go and do our closing? Okay. Or do you want to go ahead and ask the questions so now? Each of you had a question. I think they'll answer it during their closing. <coughs> Excellent. Are you sure? Well, what we'll, we'll be at is if your question is not answered, we'll, be, uh, we'll give you a chance to I, and make a follow up. Okay. So members, um, I think the, the evidence and kind of the facts are pretty well established in this case. We, we know what happened. Um, it's really just a question of what's the appropriate thing to be done. Um, you heard that uh, the respondent was convicted after pleading guilty to driving while intoxicated, endangering a person, a class A misdemeanor in December of 22. Uh, that led to us filing one count in our administrative complaint, which is conviction of a crime harmful to the public. Um, this would be a different case um, if the respondent had had a moving violation of some kind and then was pulled over, blew over, and was arrested. Um, he was driving erratically, let's say, got pulled over. Um, but here we I have a clear victim that was involved uh, that was a member of the public. The crime happened on a major roadway as well. Um, so I, I think it's pretty clear that it is uh, a crime harmful to the public here. So the violation in that sense is straightforward. Um, the hard part is deciding what the appropriate sanction should be given the violation. Um, he hasn't had any subsequent arrests. Um, he completed his criminal probation. If he was still on probation, um, I'd probably be asking for him to go on probation for the duration of that. Um, but given that there's no evidence that he has an ongoing substance abuse issue um, and he's already been discharged from his criminal probation, I don't really think probation is appropriate here, would accomplish anything without any other charges. Um, 
So there are some mitigating factors, but the, the mitigators don't cancel out the violation. Um, so I think it's it's reasonable and proportional to the violation to issue them a censure or a letter of reprimand along with a fine. Uh, so that's my recommendation. Um, uh, there is an issue that I want to raise with the board based on um, council's uh, argument in her opening. Uh, and, and that is the board establishing a precedent for not imposing sanctions in a case where the violation is clearly established. Um, so, so I certainly want, wouldn't want to see precedent created whereby a respondent could come before the board and be able to say, well, yes, I definitely did this. I definitely committed a violation, but you shouldn't discipline me because you didn't discipline anyone uh, in this case. Um, and further, I, I certainly wouldn't want to create the impression uh, among licensees or, or among the public at large um, that the board um, was um, really looking away from a violation in this case. Um, so that, that was just something I, I think is, is relevant to the consideration here. Um, I think that's a, a reasonable and appropriate sanction is to issue him a censure or a letter of reprimand and a fine. Um, so that's my recommendation. Um, so I'm asking you to find him in violation as alleged and then sanction his license. Thank you. Yeah. And I just want to follow up on the, the last statement that was made. Again, the statute, the statute is permissive. The, the lawyer on your on your board will acknowledge in, in, in legal statutes, in, in Indiana statutes, we have permissive language <coughs> using may, and we have mandatory language <coughs> using shall. If it's permissive, the board has discretion. If it's stated that the board shall impose any of the following sanctions, if it finds the uh, provider subject to disciplinary, then yes, the council's argument would hold, hold weight. That if, if it was shall, and he committed a violation, he must be sanctioned. But that is not how the law was written, and that is not how any court would interpret the law. It's very clear this board has discretion. It uses the word may. The board can find that a provider violated you know, one, of the, one of the statutory duties, but still find that under the circumstances, it is not appropriate to sanction that provider. And I think what was most significant to me, um, we had the pre, pre-hearing conference and during conversation with Dr. Mastin and counsel and Dr. Adiagbo, it, it sort of came out to me that this was unusual to have a licensing complaint filed and an administrative complaint filed for a first time DUI with no addiction issues. And, and you know, it's not a case where, thank you, where Dr. Adiagbo was intoxicated at work or intoxicated while on call. This is completely separate from his medical license. And my understanding from our pre-hearing conference is that under those circumstances, you usually don't even have an administrative complaint filed. There was some question raised as why, why did we have one here? And when I pushed back on that and tried to get this dismissed, I was told, no, we have to proceed because there was a complaint. So, so I think that stating that in every case you have to have a sanction means that if, if, if an administrative complaint is filed and the provider admits to the behavior alleged, then there's no situation where they can't be sanctioned. And that's not in compliance with the statute. Again, as I stated earlier, I, I don't know of any profession in Indiana where a first time DUI impacts your profession for the rest of your career. If we were here and Dr. Adiabo was on his second or his third arrest, or he had failed counseling, or you know he was in and out of addiction treatment centers, we would have a completely different situation. But this is truly a really bad decision on one night in his life when he was off duty and not practicing medicine. And if this board censures him and finds him, that bad decision in his personal life is going to follow him every time he gets a license in another state or is, is doing credentialing, it's going to be reported on that National Practitioner's Data Bank. And for him, as a forensic pathologist, now perhaps if he was another specialty that never needed to be in a courtroom unless they wanted to do expert consulting on the side, then maybe it would be less of a problem. But for him, because of his specialty, he finds himself testifying frequently. 
and this directly impacts his ability to do that. A jury is going to be focused on a decision that he made in his private life in May of 2020 and perhaps discredit his valid medical findings. And so that, that is substantial. Again, I think we've talked about uh, the harassment he has suffered in Indiana and Kansas over the last several years and ask that the board sort of show him mercy. He has, he has dealt with more licensing issues that were unwarranted than, than most physicians have. And a censure on his license, a reprimand, a fine, is going to add fuel to the fire <clears throat> for these individuals who have been harassing him. He's been diagnosed with PTSD because of these, these individuals. And this will continue to exacerbate those issues. Uh, overall, Dr. Adiato, <clears throat> I think it came out a bit in his testimony today, he is deeply sorry for what happened. He does feel like he's paid his debt to society and he wants to continue being able to practice medicine um, with an unrestricted license and without the reprimands on his medical license as a physician. We thank you all very much for your time. Dr. Christina, I think I was answered my question. I got a question for the state. Mm -hmm. in, in researching this case, to your knowledge, is there any precedent that is before the board that we have issued a first time offense, like the respondents being charged with, with a reprimand? I'm not sure. You don't have that information? No. I, I also have a question for either counsel. The consumer complaint arose as a result of him self-reporting, correct? Easy. So the only reason there's a consumer complaint is because he told us that this happened Correct. And the state put that whole complaint on hold. He self-reported two days after the accident. They put it on hold and waited until he pled guilty. When he pled guilty in December of 2022, we had the administrative complaint filed and, and we self, he self-reported the guilty plea as well. I contacted the state on his behalf to inform them of the, the details of his plea. And uh, within two, less than two months later, they filed this administrative complaint. Thank you for Well, I don't know, maybe as a part of discussion, but to answer this question, having served longer on the board, most of the time, if it's a first time violation, we will refer it to ISMA for evaluation, and then the board makes a judgment. Okay, you have to save it for discussion. Yeah. Okay. All right, please proceed. So, before you close, um, I think we need to clarify whether the um, whether that assessment, whether you're going to move for that to be admitted uh, with redaction for public or not, and then you'll you'll need to make a determination of whether we're actually admitting that as part of a record. Yeah. I, I would move for it to be admitted if the board can guarantee confidentiality in the documents. Chef had with no objection. Interest. Okay. And I also have the individual's discharge summary, if the board would accept it under the same <coughs> strictly confidential. Okay. Do, you, do you have those marked? So are we doing I, I provided a copy. Right. So thank you, Adam. So <coughs> please admit respondents exhibit one point. Yeah. It's, it's marked incorrectly at the bottom because it was originally pr given, yeah. printed it from the uh, which, which will be uh, redacted by the respondents' counsel. I mean, do we have that kind of quote here now? Mm -hmm. Okay, these proceedings, according to notice, are hereby concluded. So, can we, can we have that while we discuss? Absolutely. You do not want the medical record while no. we discuss. Okay, uh, discussion. My feeling is clearly. There was a violation. It went to the court. He pleaded guilty, which is a misdemeanor. However, this incident happened in May of 2020, and we have three years and nine months since then. He has been evaluated in Kansas, and they found him fit. So I don't know if it makes sense at this time to try to refer it to ISMA, the other impaired physician, <clears throat> because He's not even drinking alcohol. So yes, I'll find him guilty of violation or responsible. 
but I am not sure that we need to impose the sanction at this time for first time violation since there is no further violation in three years and nine months. Thank you. I mean, the, the state's concern is about a crime, the other crime, you know, threats of the public. I, I don't think that exists anymore. And although we can't review the cases, I have a hard time believing a year and a half later, this woman's death is involved in the facts that consist of doing that. So, yeah, I think it's to that as an oncologist, probably she died of a mass in yeah. the lung, which may be carcinoma. So I think that is totally unrelated. Her hair bag went off and she had a towel. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. It's not screw it. Yes. So my concern, Mr. Chairman, has always been kind of precedent. You know, what is the precedent? If state then know the precedent. I mean, certainly, if there's one case out of hundreds of cases we've done that have gone to the point of reprimand with the first offense of a self-reported person who went through, all, jumped through all the hoops to do what he needed to do to get reinstated, not only for his license, but just to stay good in good standing with the board. I have an issue with that. You know, I, I think the state needs to be forthcoming. I, I mean, we kind of rely on, to my knowledge and my tenure here, I haven't seen that. That was my concern during the settlement hearing. It's like, why are we doing that? And, and if you're weighing the public trust, I mean, the fact that he is a forensic pathologist, I think has something to do with it. And if he, he, he was, uh, is used by the state, well, as, that, that's not one well, of his that, credibility. Right, right. That, that, but you but, weigh that against the I, I'm danger looking at, the public. Right. I'm, I'm looking at what has been out there. I mean, do we have precedent? Has there ever happened? State can't say that. I mean, to me, if you hit a home run, you'd know you hit one home run. Well, well, most of the time, these things have been referred to ISMA for yeah, evaluation. Yeah, exactly. We never heard them. <clears throat> well, I will, something I will note, though, too, is I think as a counterbalance, though, it's, I, I don't know if we've, we've had a case actually go to hearing where um, they're coming in and they're saying, yeah, there's a violation, don't do any punishment. I mean, that's, that's kind of a counterbalance, too. Well, and <clears throat> also... Um, I'm not sure um, in terms of what the what this board's actual effect is of what they're doing here today I I'm not sure how much more it's going to cause him issues from a licensing standpoint versus his criminal record he has a conviction a criminal conviction and that's already going to show so the argument that it follows for licensing decisions or anything like that it's already a matter of public record that he's criminally convicted harvey i've got two points you made have there been instances where the board found violation but acted not to impose any sanction the answer is yes it has been done yeah number two i agree with you that there is already public record of the conviction so if the board decides to take any action I think we shouldn't be worried about that part. We should determine it on its own merits. Yeah, that's, yeah, right. That's what I'm saying. I believe in most of these cases that have come across where it's not just the OWI, it's OWI plus something. They have had agree orders. So we don't hear them. Okay. You know, it's coming up before the board. They're offered a, a letter of reprimand, which to a lot of doctors sounds better than probation. So I think that is where most of these terminate, right? So we don't hear this. We don't hear it in full, at least. There's something agreed. Now, I don't recall one that is simply OWI, but I do recall some that are OWI plus some other circumstance. Um, first offense. Yeah, yeah. Like uh, I, I'm struggling with, with the first offense and potentially, you know, do I, in, in the last few years, I, since I've been on the board, I don't recall doing anything with the first offense, provided they followed all the steps they needed to, and also self-reporting. Um, I think that, you know, yes, in this case, there was the, the bodily harm, 
I think the ones that didn't have bodily harm just got lucky. You know, they were in OWI, but they didn't happen to have a collision. It was seen, you know, while they were, while they were under his heart. So, um, I, I lean, I, I lean towards no, you know, action at this point with the first offense. Yeah, I. It, here's my view. So I believe our job, saying, Ms. Harvey, you need the, the correct phrasing. Our job is to make sure that he is not harmful to the public in his practice of medicine. Good, good. Correct. Right. Um, if this was June of 2020, then we would say, you got to get checked out. First of all, you should have told us about it. <coughs> you need to talk to Isma. You need to get an evaluation to make sure you don't have alcohol use disorder. You know, you need to resolve your, you know, criminal complaints. Um, it, it's all really all been done. And I think, I think the acumen assessment to me is very valuable. Um, he's not, he's not here making excuses saying, well, I was having a bad day and, or, you know, people are picking on me or whatever. He said he made a mistake. He owns it. Which always, uh, I don't got that. I think is helpful, um, and so the question is, would it be harmful for him to continue practicing as a forensic pathologist? I I think, or does he need to be punished for this? He couldn't punish. He's he's got his criminal uh, you know complaints that he's had to deal with. Now he's got civil complaints he's had to deal with. Uh, the license bureau has restricted his driving. So I'm not sure what we need to do. I think to add on to that, yeah. you know, that's at the same point as like, if you talk about harm to the public, given what he actually does, and he's a forensic pathologist protecting the public, um, saying, testifying in these cases that yeah, this person was fueled by such and such or whatever, whatever the not allow or give losing credibility anything that we do that would help them lose credibility but i think is a, is a disservice to the public and i think it's the opposite you know, the last thing i'll say is you know again i don't know any of the details of this kind of persecution by this family but inadvertently they're creating sympathy for him um so the putting their own cause i guess if that's if their job is to destroy him so what the board needs to do, I think, at this juncture, since uh, even though both sides in their testimony today um, submitted that there's an admitted violation, I uh, don't believe we received like stipulated findings of fact. And so I think you still need to vote to find that the violation is there. And then once you find on the violation, then you can decide if or if not to do anything about that. I don't see the accurate report on the side. Do you want to see it? It's actually uploaded into the. Oh, it is. All right. Oh, I see it now. Thank you. Sorry. Oh. Okay. So if we if we find an in violation, then what is the what are options? Then your option would be you right. can Thank impose you. any of the sanctions that are under statute under one nine nine, and you can choose to take no further action. I make a motion that. Find violation. And you're saying that we'll that. And, if, and if we do that, is that reportable to the NPDB? I don't know. Finding the they... violation itself. Yeah. <coughs> if, with, without just <coughs> the board. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not 100 percent sure. I'm not. Was I? Evan, do you know? If there's if they're they find the violation but there's no discipline imposed, does it still get uploaded in an action to in a yeah. I don't yeah. think it does. Only no, it's disciplinary not, action. Unless there is sanction associated so, with it. Like, it's not just one of the statics. Thank you. So we're acknowledging that a violation exists. Mm -hmm. Can you thought? No. That would be my and, and well, all the what, what we hear, just before we do that, what would be your follow up? No discipline. Yes. All right, so go ahead and make your motion. Make a motion. Of course, we have to do two things separately, right? Mm -hmm. So, violation, yes. Okay, Dr. Rai, motion for violation. Second. Tory, second. All in favor? Aye. Okay. 
a motion, no sanction in view of the circumstances. Okay, so no sanction or, or discipline. All right. Got it. I second Dr. Bride, Dr. Christina. All in favor? Okay. Thank you all. Thank you all. Appreciate the time. Thank you. Um, you'll draft the order. <laughs> um, would, um, can you get me one please?